Hello and welcome to my weekly podcast, Through the Bible in 10 Plus Years. Well, I've been stalling uh, to try to catch up with the writing up of explanatory notes with these um, Sunday podcasts, but I've run out of excuses. We had Pentecost last week. I did an overview of 1 Corinthians two weeks ago. I think it's time to move on, and we're into 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, I'm just going to do the first, I think, nine verses. It's a 20-some verse chapter, so maybe, Hope Springs Eternal, maybe I can write up these nine verses uh, today and kind of not, at least not get further behind. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is a a special passage for me as somebody who comes out of the holiness uh, tradition because this is a classic uh, entire sanctification preaching text. And although... uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. In seminary, a lot of the, a lot of the holiness uh, preaching texts that I grew up with, kind of, well, that's not what it's exactly about. That was kind of the the theme. I would look, well, you know, l- pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And that's yes, but you you don't shove a whole doctrine of an entire sanctification in one word, holiness, the word concept, you know, kind of fallacy. Um, it's basically saying you need to be, you know, free of sin, but which is true, and that maps to holiness. But uh, the the um, entire sanctification puts a whole lot more weight on a verse like that than than it actually will bear. Um, similarly, uh, you know, Wesley himself, uh, Hebrews six, let us go on to perfection. Um, again, we need to go on to maturity. That's for sure. But you don't put in there, let us go on to a second definite work of grace, whereby the heart is cleansed of inbred sin. You know, uh, that's that's putting an awful lot of theology into a, a word that basically means uh, maturity. Um, so I won't go into more, but, but basically as I was going through seminary and I learned how to read the Bible inductively and read it in context, I found that a lot of the preaching texts uh, that have been used for entire sanctification, um, they, they're related, it's th- they are related, but they're not... They're they're not full fully orbed as as it is. They're not they're not a, an entire doctrine or article of faith. They're just sentences um, that are doing a little piece of the puzzle. What I really like about First Corinthians uh, three here at the beginning is because it it really does set up a typology of three types of person. Now, if you if you go back to the last part of First Corinthians two. Uh, you'll notice that uh, 1 Corinthians 2 ended with a contrast between what we might call the natural person and the spiritual person. Um, Actually, natural man or natural person is not really a great translation either. It's hard to translate the sukkakos person, the soul person, not the soul man. That's not what it's, (laughs) that's not what it's talking about. Something different. But it's it's a person who is is basically just the human person, just the animal person, just the a human as a default. Um, let's go ahead and say fallen uh, human, uh, the person who does not discern the things of God. Paul says, as a contrast to the spiritual person who discern has the Holy Spirit and can discern. Uh, the mind and the will of God. The spiritual person realizes that the cross is the power of God, that you can win by losing. You can, the the last shall be first. Uh, The spiritual person sees that. The natural person says, that doesn't make any sense. The natural person says, I I need to win. I need to be, I I need to defeat the the others. Uh, The the spiritual person realizes sometimes God wants us to lose. Um, the cross is the foolishness of God, Paul says. It, it's wiser than um, the, some of the smartest Greek philosophy and, and so forth. And so uh, the end of 1 Corinthians 2 sets up this, this uh, contrast between a person who is mere, merely human, animal, uh, sukakos, a soul person, and the person who has the Holy Spirit and is therefore spiritually discerning the values and will of God. Now, when we turn to chapter 3, which, of course, there were no chapter divisions in Paul's letter. Uh, it was just continuous text. In fact, there weren't, weren't even spaces between the words in Paul's letter. Just blo- They did a word find, block text, back in those days. How did they even figure it out? Well, you, you practice and you, 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 know, you, cup, you, you get to be able to do these things. We, don't, we have spaces, so we don't have to exercise our minds that way. 
But here in chapter 3, he has a different contrast. If the contrast at the end of 1 Corinthians 2 was between the natural person and the spiritual person, the contrast in 1 Corinthians 3 is between the carnal or fleshly person, the sarkikos person, um, and the spiritual person, the pneumatikos uh, person. Now, the carnal person here in 1 Corinthians 13 is a believer. They are a Christian. They are a follower of Christ. They have the Holy Spirit. So they are in the people of God. But they're not spiritual. They're not where they're supposed to be. And so you can see, and John Wesley and other Wesleyans, uh, broadly speaking, th for the last 200 years, have seen in this typology a model for what we call entire sanctification. Now, again, to put that entire sanctification on it is to uh, is to take it further than Paul takes it. Paul, Paul's not drawing sharp lines here. Have you been entirely sanctified yet? Are you still carnal? You know, come to the altar. You know, Paul's not creating a theology of entire sanctification, you know, here. But it is a close model uh, to the holiness preaching uh, that I heard. And that is namely that if you are a fleshly Christian, if you are a carnal Christian, if you are not yet a spiritual Christian, as it were, and I realize that opens the door for all kinds of arrogance and condescension that, you know, we, we can we can take the most divine concepts and twist them and, and use them for evil. Um, but we, we have a general model here of the person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, the natural person, the person who is a believer, but they're still in the flesh, the carnal person, fleshly person, and the person who not only has the Holy Spirit, but is being guided and living by the Holy Spirit. And so I've spent a long time uh, in preface. Let's dig into the text of 1 Corinthians 3. And if you're watching the video version of this, I have uh, Interlinear Bible up. Um, so you can see the Greek and follow along if you want. Uh, verse 1, And I, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to fleshly or carnal person, sar sarkanos people, as babes, babies in Christ. So again, we have this sense that a lot of times when a person first becomes a Christian, now I, Paul doesn't say it has to be this way, but you would expect for a baby uh, in Christ to be less mature than somebody who has been in Christ for some, some time. So this is, by the way, not a model that Paul came up with. We find this in secular philosophy as well, this idea of training ourselves and disciplining ourselves and becoming more mature in our, in our virtue, uh, for example. But a person who is in the flesh, and of course, Paul will develop this. I, I personally date Galatians after 1 Corinthians, and, and I certainly date Romans after 1 Corinthians. So Paul has some time for the Holy Spirit and for others for him to chew on this and to develop a theology of the spirit and the flesh. You know, that which is in the flesh uh, cannot please God, he says in, in Romans 8. And so he talks about getting beyond our flesh. What is our flesh? Our flesh is um, all, I, I, would, I would basically say, when Paul talks about the flesh, he's talking about all the temptations and weaknesses and su susceptibility to sin that are part of our fallen humanity. Um, and so, there are certain natural urges we have. We have urges uh, to have uh, sex. We have urges uh, to eat. We have urges to uh, be fruitful, multiply. We have urges to subdue the earth. Um, to, so we have these these things that can be good. They were good in Adam, you know, before he sinned. But they can be twisted. They can be taken advantage of. They can be uh, act. They can act upon inappropriate objects. You know, so to, to be sexually attracted is good. To be sexually attracted and to act on it with the wrong person is, is bad. And so, so basically, our, our flesh, in that sense, is our skin under the power of sin. When you want to know what Paul means by flesh in Romans, I would say it is our skin under the power of sin. And so Paul, when he says that the, a lot of the Corinthians are still fleshly, He's saying that they have not, uh, they have not uh, managed to uh, reach a stage of their spiritual development to where they are able to conquer um, the temptations of their skin, the temptations of their flesh. And in particular, they are not loving toward one another. 
They have a tendency to say, me, 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 me. Um, me over you. I'm better than you. I'm more spiritual than you. I have more knowledge than you. I have more rights than you. Um, uh, I, I'm right and you're wrong. And this is fleshly behavior. This is what we call carnal. A carnivore eats fl- uh, meat, eats skin. Um, and so uh, if you're fleshly, you are oriented around um, the um, the fulfilling of the bad temptations and desires of your uh, fallen your fallen humanity, and you would expect a baby to have more trouble conquering those uh, um, drives and desires uh, than somebody who's been at it for for a while. It doesn't have to be that way, um, but but you you would expect that, and that's the topology that Paul Paul's basically telling them they need to grow up spiritually to where it's not about me 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 me, and I'm going to get what I have coming to me, and I'm not going to let other people tell me what to do, and I'm going to do what I you know I have knowledge and you don't, and I'm going to act according to what I know because you're stupid, you know th- this me 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 me. It's all about me. It's about me getting what I deserve. It's about my rights. It's about what I have coming to me. That's all fleshly, and the Corinthians had a lot of it. Verse 2, for I gave you milk and not food, not solid food, because you are not yet able. But you're not, now you're still not able. Verse 2, for still you are fleshly. Here he says sarkikos instead of sarkonos. I don't think that there's really a d- distinction, probably probably synonyms. You're, you're, you're still fleshly. For where among you there is jealousy? Okay, we're, we're going to find out what is this flesh stuff? What is this fleshliness? When, when you have jealousy and strife, are you not fleshly? Yes, you are. You're, you're acting according to the flesh. And are you not walking according to the human? Verse 4, for whenever someone should say, well, I am of Paul, and another person says, I am of Apollos, are you not just being people? You're being merely human. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the ideal theology, Christians are not merely human. We're not just animals. We, we are spiritual. And being spiritual means that we aren't just out for me. We aren't just out for my group. We're not just looking out for number one. We're not just making sure that my people are taken care of and forget the other people. Indicative of a spiritual mindset is that we are thinking about others more than ourselves. God, others, me. I am third, as the saying goes. Uh, and notice, by the way, that Paul has has limited the field a little. In chapter one, he says, some say I'm of Cephas, some say I'm of Christ. I think here we're getting down to the real issue, that the real issue isn't you have some, you have a Peter party, you know, at uh, Corinth and you have a Jesus party uh, at at, uh, Corinth. I think ultimately when, when push comes to shove, the real conflict is between the part of the congregation that is loyal to Paul and the part of the congregation that is using Apollos as an excuse to reject and undermine the authority of Paul. And so you can see that when he gets down to brass tacks here in chapter 3, he's just talking about him and Apollos. Verse 5, Therefore, who is Apollos? And who is Paul? Servants through whom you came to faith, and each one has given uh, as the Lord has given. Each has played their role. And Paul goes on in in verse 6 to say what that role was. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul doesn't ultimately get the credit for the church at Corinth. Apollos doesn't ultimately get the credit uh, for the church at Corinth. They both played a role, but God is the one who gave the increase. And this is the attitude that we all should have as ministers of Christ. Um, Verse 7, he goes on, For neither the one who planted is something, nor is the one who watered, but God is is the one, the one who gave the increase. That's the one that, the one planting and the one who waters, they're one. We are both the same. Uh, And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are fellow workers of God, um, we are the field of God, and you are the building uh, of God. God's building you on top of uh, the field. A kind of a mixed metaphor there. He might have said, you're the crop. Uh, by the way, when he gets to chapter 4, Paul will say, uh, you know, but I'm I'm your daddy. Uh, and so you should you should privilege me a little. So there's a little bit of a tension between what he says here and what he says in chapter 4. When he gets to chapter 4, he does say, you really should pay more attention to me than to Apollos because I'm 
you know, I'm the one that founded the church. I'm your dad in the in the Lord. But in terms of, of worth, in terms of value, Paul is not more worth worth more than Apollos. Apollos is not worth more than Paul. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. Um, it's not their gifts and graces uh, that um, give them merit, um, because ultimately it's all about God. Well, I got through verse nine, uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. So perhaps I can get it written up. Uh, to eventually publish explanatory notes on 1 Corinthians. I have a commentary on 1 and 2 Corinthians with the Wesleyan Publishing House that you can buy uh, already if, if you really want it. Um, you, you won't find a lot different in it, I hope, than what I say in these weekly uh, podcasts. Well, this has been Through the Bible in 10 plus years.